views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hello and welcome to the Social Justice Forum. I am Darren Hyman. Of course, we thank you for joining us. For those of you that asked the question, what exactly the Social Justice Forums are all about? Well, we provide a deeper understanding and go into deeper depth, if you will, uh, with issues and inequities that communities of color face. And then we also get multiple points of view, trying to bring you more perspectives as we have topics that need discussion. And then we have guests that have answers. And we try to bring you both solutions and also talk about some of the problems right here on the social justice forums. One of the big problems that's been plaguing New York City and particularly here the borough of the Bronx for a long period of time is the violence that's occurred over the summer. Many people are up in rage and in arms about the fact that young people are particularly losing their life to gun violence. A recent rally was held to talk about dealing with just that. It was a march to end gun violence. It was to save our sons and sisters. And our reporter, Arlene Makoko, was out there and she brings us a story right now. They're calling it Operation Save Our Sons and Sisters. Community leaders were gathered at 170th Street and Sheridan Avenue to denounce the recent shootings in the Concourse and Claremont Village communities. Right here at this very intersection on July 5th, Anthony Robinson, a father, was shot dead walking his seven-year-old daughter down the street. We wanted to come right here because the 44th Precinct in Claremont and Concourse has seen far too many shootings in the last 30 days. 40-year resident Smiley O. Smith joined others here, agreeing that the shooting must stop. So the, the gun violence has to stop one way or another. So I'm here because Gun violence is a part of our communities that we need to eradicate in its totality. And the only way to do that is to be a unified front. Also calling for an end to gun violence was Eve Hendricks, the mother of college-bound 17-year-old basketball player from Monroe High School, Brandon Hendricks, who was fatally shot June 28th, just days after graduating. Police arrested 22-year-old Naheem Luke in connection to the shooting. But DA Darcel Clark shared that a return to safe streets requires the cooperation of everyone, including law enforcement. We need the police to help us do this work. There are good cops out there. The bad ones, we got things for them. And I'm the first to tell you that I will do that. But the good ones who are helping this community, the people that care, the ones that are helping to apprehend these shooters, those are the ones that we need. And we need them to be able to do their work. So anything that's stopping them from being able to do their work is stopping our community from being safe. Operation Save Our Sons and Sisters also looks to create safe environments for learning and sharing. Operation SOS is going to not only start here at the 4-4, but we're going to travel all across the district because we want to talk to young people. We want to engage with them. We want to give them options, something better than they have been shown. We come together as people of faith, of clergy, community partners, anti-gun violence advocates, elected officials. We're all coming together because we know our children and families deserve better. The speakers here are inviting the public to join them on a march against violence. It'll begin at Mott Playground at 5 o'clock on Thursday. For BronxNet, this is Arlene Makoko. And thank you, Arlene. And right now, we are pleased to be joined by Bronx District Attorney Darcel Clark, who joins us right here on the Social Justice Forums. And uh, District Attorney Clark, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me, Darren. Yeah, so as we look back at yesterday's event, or I should say the, that, yeah, yesterday's event, talk to us a little bit about the event um, and your thoughts. Do you feel like your voice was heard? I absolutely feel like my voice was heard, but it's not about my voice. It's about everyone's voice. That was a tremendous showing of unity in our community, something that we really need because this violence is out of control. It's killing our sons, our sisters, as we talked about, SOS. It's killing our elders. It is just damaging our community. So I wanted to do something to let the community know that I know what's going on, that I care about it, I care about them, and that I love them, and that we need to stop the violence. And I think that the outpour of support by so many people yesterday showed that that message is being heard. 
Yeah, it's a message that has to ring loud and clear. I mean, obviously, New York City has gone through its, its share of violence recently, uh, but more particularly right here uh, in the borough of the Bronx. Uh, it's kind of almost a little unprecedented, would you say, for yourself, seeing this kind of wave of violence the way that we're seeing it right now? Yeah, I think, it, you know, it's just so many things. I think that what really um, is, is highlighting it is the fact that we're coming out of this COVID. So we had right. so much, you know, death in another way you know, seeing that through public health and, and sickness. And we were all cooped up inside. And even being inside, like we knew the sickness was out there, but if you're home, you're safe, it was good. But now things are opening up, we're back out. And people have just decided to just settle scores that were festering while they were inside. People are uptight, they lost their jobs. Some people are still not well. Um, you know, homelessness, evictions, hanging over their heads, I mean, Folks are uptight, and when things like that happen, you know, problems happen, and people try to solve their problems in different ways, and unfortunately, we have members of our community, not a lot, but enough that's causing this violence. They yeah. decided that that's how they're going to solve their problems. I think, you know, when we look at some of the some of the cases that are actually before us and some of the things that we've seen, the images have been graphic and the images have been so painful. I, I think about Anthony Robinson and, you know, he's walking with his little girl and he's murdered in broad daylight right in front of uh, his daughter as well as in front of a community. I know you can't talk too much about cases, but but talk to us about and let us know what, what, what you can and, and, and even how that has even affected you. Well, you know, I, I don't want to see that. That little girl now is going to grow up the rest of her life. That's the last time she saw her father shot dead in the street. She's running from bullets. No child, no child of mine, yours, or ours should ever have to go through something like that. So I automatically thought of her and knew that it was just important that the community people got to get involved to stop this. We need to solve these kind of crimes. And what happens is that people do not cooperate. That's what makes it so difficult. In this case in particular, we were able to solve it. We have people under arrest. We have people charged with this. But this was a retaliation. This was a shooting um, a, a day or hours before Anthony Robinson. Then Anthony Robinson is shot um, while a, in a drive-by with a car with a number of individuals inside. And then hours later, two more people were shot and killed. One of them was in the car at the time that Anthony Robinson was shot. And so that, that double homicide happens two, a couple of hours later. And then yesterday, on yesterday, Anthony Robinson's brother was arrested for being a person that was involved in the double homicide and re retaliation of his brother. So that's what we're seeing. If we had people cooperate and talk to us when one, the first shooting happens and we apprehend them and we hold them accountable, that should stop the violence. But what's happening here is nobody cooperates because they're gonna take it matters into their own hands, which means you have that shooting, then you have Anthony Robinson shot, then we have the two other men shot and killed. So it just perpetuates itself, and we have got to stop it. Yeah, and another tragedy that we know right here in our community, 17-year-old Brandon Hendricks, who uh, lost his life tragically. Uh, we here at Bronx that, of course, covered the services for uh, Brandon, uh, Brandon Hendricks, and of course, you also had the opportunity of calling his mother and allowing her to be able to speak uh, at the rally. Uh, just your thoughts about putting her up in front of the people. She's amazing. She, she buried her son a week ago, and she has not stopped a day since. The day after that funeral, I was with her at a meeting in Jackson Houses where we're meeting with young men who wanted to have a conversation with the police about how they're being treated in the community and how the, how the police are being treated by the community. And, and Ms. Hendricks was right there to set the tone to let them know we got to get past these differences. I'm somebody here who lost my son. You got to have these conversations. We got to move on because we got to work together to keep our community safe. She's amazing. My team is working extremely hard to make sure she gets all the services that she needs. And of course, we are working towards that final trial where we could get justice for Brandon and for his mother. 
you, you got a lot of work ahead of you, uh, some cases, some real major cases that we, of course, know here that you're dealing with. And then the other stuff that we probably have no idea that you have to contend with on a day-to-day -day basis. But for an outsider looking in, uh, and they look, and sometimes they make a sweeping generalization of the borough and say, listen, this is, you know, these are a bunch of, you know, these are a bunch of people in, in the Bronx and they're all crazy. But what we're actually seeing, actually, from what I understand, is predominantly a lot of gang activity, correct? We have, we have a lot of gang and crew activity. And, and it's unfortunate because these are young people that if we gave them something else to do, if we gave them more, if there were more resources in the community, they wouldn't resort to the crews and the gangs and the guns. They would just resort to each other to help lift up our community. And that's the message that we have to get out there, that we have to work with the Cure Violence groups who are right there with them. They have walked that walk. They have been there, they're credible messengers to stop them before they pick up that gun and retaliate, before they pick up the gun in the first place to start the beef in the first place. We need to all work together, you know, in order to get to get that done. And, and it's just a message, you know, yesterday at the rally, we had a couple of the young people from the Cure Violence um, group speak. And one young man just couldn't even, he, he couldn't even pull himself together. I was standing right next to him. I could see him shaking with, with just the emotion because he lost a friend of his three weeks ago to gun violence. These young people are seeing each other die. They shouldn't see that. They should be growing up together, getting married or being together, starting families, you know, starting their careers. And instead, they don't know if they're gonna live from one day to the next. I don't want that for our young people. I don't want that for our community. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've, I've spoken at schools before and I think one of the most troubling times for me was uh, when I had the opportunity to speak uh, at a school right there in the South Bronx. And I asked, you know, the proverbial question, what do you want to be when you grow up? And uh, the young man said, I just want to make it to 21. And I think that that's horrible that we have to think about our young people in that kind of context, given the fact of all that's going on and what they think that possibly, you know, they may not be able to make it to 21. But look, we spent a lot of time talking about problems. Let's talk a little bit about solutions. Um, and, and one of these things is about how do we uh, improve the life of young people? Because when we talk about, you know, social justice here, I believe that a part of social justice is also creating opportunities and programs and exposure for young people to be able to make a positive decision and also to be able to pivot them from the pitfalls that possibly can happen. So give us your thought, what you're seeing as a DA. I'm trying to do everything to do crime prevention and to, pro to, to provide those opportunities. Working with the city, you know, they almost cut the summer youth employment uh, program, um, but they brought it back, making sure we connect young people to, to those jobs, even though just for the summer and temporary. You do a lot of networking, that's a lot of, socialization that happens there that's done in a positive way. Um, I run a program called Saturday Night Lights, where before COVID, of course, then now that so many things are closed, but what that is is that on Saturday nights, we opened, it, we opened up two centers in our, in our community, one in the South Bronx, one in the West Bronx, one for basketball, the other one for soccer and uh, kickboxing and different you know, activities for Saturday night for them to be in a safe space where they can do some of those things. And we're also bringing, you know, college preparatory um, classes with them and, and all kind of job training for them to be able to do, you know, something else. I, you know, I'm doing re-entry programs for those who may have gone away and returned back to the community to make sure that they have a proper adjustment so they don't end up recycling and, and recidivating and going back uh, into jail. So we want to do a lot of things. And a new thing that I want to bring about, and I'm working with a partnership with a, a doctor who works at Columbia um, University and through Lincoln Hospital, that we need to get more doctors involved in helping these young people with the trauma that they've experienced. People don't realize the trauma. Like that little girl now, we need to get her some help now. Because right. that goes untreated, she's going to be picking up a gun, or she's going to hate men, or she's all kinds of things can be going through her mind. We got to make sure that she's treated now. And I've been having these conversations while I've been out in the community lately, listening to the trauma that's in the voices of these young men. And I'm not talking about the teens now. I'm talking about the 20-something-year-olds, because those are the ones that we also have to worry about. They become forgotten at times. You know, everybody's thinking about the kids. 
And we got to do the kids. We always have to do the kids. And then the teens, you know, there's programs for them. But there's nothing for these young men, 21 to 20, you know, nine, in that area where they've grown past those two stages and maybe they didn't get the resources they need. So now where they are, and all they know now is settle the score, pick up the, pick up the gun, be in a crew, be in a gang. That's the life that they know. We need to give them options as well. When I spoke yesterday, you know, I talked about the, the cases that we know, Brandon Hendricks, you know, that was in the papers. Everybody know the one-year-old child in Brooklyn. Um, we had Tiana um, Johnson uptown celebrating, graduating from Monroe College with her associate's degree, gunned down, you know, at a barbecue, celebrating her graduate. Those are the ones that we see in the people all, paper all the time. But what about the ones that you don't know? The names we don't get to know, I care about them too. I care about the young men who are actually making these decisions on picking up the guns. I want them to know that I love them too and I want them to live. So I want to do all I can to give them options and they just need to know that they have a DA that I'm willing to do that. That I recognize that not all of them are gang members. Some of them just live in the community and you know, in order to survive, you got to know the gang members. Yeah. Okay? So that don't mean you in a gang, but you live in a community where you know that you got to survive and you have to be friends with people that you grew up with. Some people go one way, others go another way. So I understand that it's not all of our young men that have gone that way, but even those who have, I still love them and I want to do something for them. Gun violence is major. And I mean, when we talk about young people who are engaging in gun violence, the thought of it in many ways is unheard of, but then yet and still the fact remains, a lot of young people are still picking up guns and they're using them and they're using them to the detriment of the community and they're also taking people's lives. So uh, let me ask the question from a DA perspective, do we have any intel? Do we know where these guns are coming from? Because the average Bronxite is watching right now. People across New York City, they hear the gun violence, they hear, they say, okay, you know, but they're coming into the community some kind of way. What are we learning about, you know, these guns coming into the community? If anything that you can share. Unfortunately, New York is part of the iron pipeline is what they call it. And it comes from these states where you can get guns easily. People go down there, buy them, you know, legally, bring them up here and sell them on the streets here. We've worked with the, um, the ATF, you know, alcohol, tobacco and firearms, you know, the DEA, different federal government agencies to help us in that work. Because really, we have great laws in New York State. We have some of the strictest laws in the country. We do well, but we still have to find a way to stop the guns from coming into our community. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a dual battle. Dealing with this, want the, getting the guns from stopping to come in, and then dealing with the aftermath of what happens once the guns get in here. So we have to work with the community. Again, I, I've been pleading with the community. When something happens in your block, on your neighborhood, in your building, we all know who did it. They need to help us get to the bottom of this. If you know people who are selling guns in your community, we need to know that. Help us stop that. And that way the, the gun violence and the deaths will stop as well. So any way that we can get help from the community, we need it. Yeah. A lot of people ask the question about the gun buyback program. Is that a good, reasonable option? I mean, we've, we've heard it utilized before. Uh, some people say it works wonders. Some people say it doesn't work. From uh, your perspective, how do, you, how do you see the gun buyback program? I like gun buyback programs because every gun we get means somebody can't be shot with it. So any gun, one or a hundred, as long as we get that gun, that means a little kid can't pick it up show and tell in a room where nobody knows and, and shoot each other. That means that somebody won't be able to commit suicide with it. That means that somebody won't be able to bring it out on the street because they think they need it for protection and they end up getting shot or they shoot someone. So I'm in favor of them. Some people say, oh, the real shooters are not the ones turning in the guns. But you know what? Family members can, mothers can, community, there's community guns, people keep them in a certain place. If you know where they are, turn them in you know you get two hundred dollars or so for it but you get more than that we get better public safety in our community that gun will now not be able to hurt someone yeah yeah very 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 important um share a little bit about the work because you know many times i and, and for the years that i've been doing this when i first got started covering uh district attorneys and, and the work that goes on i always looked at it from 
a reactive point of view, that the district attorney has to deal with those people who come into the court system, dealing with those victims, dealing with that. But it was later on after spending time as a journalist that I found out that there's a lot of proactive work that goes on. And so I know that you're doing some work right now um, and you're working with Chief Mattery uh, and trying to do some stuff with community affairs. Talk a little bit about the proactive work that goes on in your office and trying to make sure that you don't see people uh, have to come your way. Well, you know, prosecution, part of prosecution is prevention and people don't realize that. So I, not only do I prosecute, but I try to prevent people from coming into the system in the first place. So we, you know, we've done several things about looking differently at the, the cases that we charge because it, you know, it creates a problem, collateral damages to an individual if they're brought in to the system for low level nonviolent crimes that we could work out in other ways. People have mental health problems, let's hook them up with um, mental health resources so that they could address the real issue that's bringing them into the criminal justice system in the first place. People need jobs, people are homeless, people have drug um, problems. We, we connect with all of those kind of community-based organizations to get people the help that they need so they never have to enter the criminal justice system. Then there's working with NYPD. Look, and it's real controversial right now, you know, working with the police. People want to defund the police and, you know, all of these things. And we got to talk about police accountability because that's real. That's truth to power, that we cannot have our police, you know, over-policing our communities or using excessive force. There's been reforms and changing the laws, making the, the, the uh, disciplinary procedures more transparent, you know, criminal prosecution more transparent. So we have ways to deal with that. But then we need the police to do their job. And people fail to realize that, you know, when something happens, they don't like the police until they need one. And that's what I find is the situation with the DA's office as well as the police. So we as two law enforcement agencies have to work together to mend the, uh, the relationship with the community so that the community can know we're not the enemies, we're here for your public safety. So Chief Madry is great to have him as a partner. He you know, has 30 years of policing experience, you know, policing some of the toughest neighborhoods in New York City, and he gets it. You know, just like me, I get it. I grew up in this borough my whole life. I grew up in public housing. I went to New York City public schools. When I walk these streets, I know what's going on because I am the community as well, and I want the community to know that. That's the relationship that we need to build. And over my last four years, I have been trying to do that. I beefed up my own community affairs bureau to send community engagement coordinators out there to deal with the clergy and the business people and the civic organizations and kids organization going into schools. We have to continue to do that so people will know the DA is not the enemy. The DA is here to make sure that you're safe and hold those accountable who bring the harm to the community. Do you find that there's this uh, misnomer in the community? I mean, when you start going out there and doing community advocacy and trying to create those bridges, because I think for a long time, it's been that wall and it's been that wall of separation. But I know that you do a great job of trying to tear down that wall, but you do recognize that there is a huge wall out there. And, and many of that is, is, is due to, you know, preconceived notions and stereotypes. No, it is. But I think that, you know, when I go out there, I get a lot of love. I got to tell you, you know, people say all kinds of bad things. It's like, I don't know where they're getting this from because I, I feel the love when I go out in the community. And I'm not just going to the communities where it's safe or where they invite me. I'm going out there. When I did that march yesterday, we went in the middle of the street. We didn't go on the Grand Concourse or some big street. We went down College Avenue right through the neighborhoods where I could just give you the statistics over the last two years, there have been homicides, you know, shootings and shots, um, shots fired, shot spotters. That's where you need to go. And when those people saw us, people came out and looked and listened. Little kids chanting, you know, with the save our streets, you know, guns down, life up, that kind of thing. And also members in the age range where they may or may not have been criminal justice involved, seeing us there saying, look, I care for you. That's why I'm here in your community, not to lock you up, but to let you know that I care about you and you should join us so that we can make your neighborhood a better place. Yeah, it's, it's amazing to see the, the love that's given. Because, you know, listen, a lot of times I've, you know, I, I see 
and it's not always a welcome reception when a DA or that law enforcement official is out there in the community, but certainly you've been able to turn the tide uh, here in the borough of the Bronx. A lot of love has been given and shared uh, to you, and it makes a difference. I think it makes a difference in, in, in being able to connect. What advice do you give to uh, community members, community-based organizations about bridging that gap? Because you seem to have gotten that down pat in terms of bridging the gap somewhat. What advice do you give to further bridge that gap? Because we've got things when we're talking about, you know, police community relations uh we've got other bridges that we need to get to uh that we need the gap to be filled in in other areas so what do you say to people about doing that and how to do, do that effectively i think that they should know is that we need their help that we're all on the same page that we have a common goal and that's to make sure that our community is safe they need to give us their ideas you know what i could come up with policies and ideas but i don't live where they live i want to meet them where they are so they can tell me, look, that kind of program is not gonna work in this neighborhood. Let me tell you what will, or let me tell you what resources we need to be brought to our community to make this a better place. That's how you bridge the gap. That's how you become more effective. And that's how when the police have to come in because the community called them in because there's a problem. And I don't wanna see violence against the cop. You know, last year, you know, it was a big thing. People were throwing water at police. That was outrageous, but look at what we got this summer, okay? Right. So that's nothing compared to what we're dealing with now. And we have to make sure that we allow the police to go in and do the job that they have to do. And they have to understand that they have to go in and do the job that they need to do, but respect the community and the community needs to respect them. There shouldn't be violence on either side by the police to the community or the community to the police. We all need to be together for one goal the safety of our community. Yeah. Well, let me switch uh, gears for a second, talk about the court system, because we know that's where you operate and that's where you function out of. Uh, and with COVID-19 happening, a lot of changes have happened, but there is this uh, thought process that possibly the courts are actually shut down. Please give uh, us and all of our viewers uh, the rundown as to what is going on with court right now, because even though people think the court is closed, I know that's wrong, court is still open. The court has never closed. The court always stayed open. A lot of the functions had to be suspended because the governor issued the pause for the entire state. But look, people who were still committing crimes were being arrested. They were being prosecuted. My office has not stopped um, drafting complaints against people that are committing crimes and you know some very serious crimes during COVID as well. But that process was still going on. The courts may wait. We, we did things virtually, just like we're doing now. Right. This, become, this has become the way of life. We can still do court work virtually. You don't have to have 3,000 people in the court building at one time to do the work of the court. So we've been working virtually, um, doing the arraignments. Um, people, you know, if people were in jail, they're able to appear in the court by uh, video. You, the work is getting done. We're disposing of cases, people that were in programs and were set to graduate or get out, you know, because of the pause, things were slowed down, but we're slowly but surely bringing them online virtually, letting them complete the things that they have to so they could go on and get their jobs and, and go to school and continue to do the work that they do. So the courts have been open. Yeah. The courts have been open, never closed, because my people are working as hard as ever from home. Yeah. It's, it's been a change, but is there any concern on your on your part? Because we know before this before COVID even happened, there was this backlog in the court system. Mm -hmm. uh, and so people are wondering now, post COVID, are you anticipating a huge backlog or are things gonna be able to get back well, to pretty much what it was? There's no anticipating about it. We have a huge backlog now. And one of the reasons why is that we haven't been able to bring the grand juries back or regular trial juries because the public is not healthy yet and, and the pause is still going on. So until we can bring that function of the court back, cases have just been piling up, you know, because it's not like people are not still getting arrested. Um, they are, they still have to be processed, but we still have all the cases that were pending pre-COVID and all the cases that have happened since then, but we have not been able to pr um, present them to grand juries because the grand jurors haven't been here. Now, the county clerk has sent out subpoenas summoning the grand jury to come back now I, the um, the court date is August 10th that we believe we will be able to start grand jury work again. 
but it's up to the public to see how many people are going to respond to the subpoenas because so many people are sick taking care of school-aged children where they have no child care you know transportation is an issue because of covid a number of covid related things are going to have an impact on how many people we actually get in to become grand jurors again yeah, you led into my next question talking about COVID and uh, give me a little bit about the trends that you're seeing because COVID-19 has definitely brought some things out in people. Uh, and so when it comes for you looking through your lens, how do you see uh, some of these trends that have occurred uh, in our community due to COVID? Well, I know unfortunately in the Bronx, you know, this the testing is behind. You know, we don't have the healthcare resources that we really need. We have poor communities here and people are compromised already be, before COVID. But now because we have high incidence of diabetes, hypertension, you know, autoimmune um, um, disease in our community, you know, people are not getting well and, and it's unfortunate and it causes trauma to them as well. This is a real public health crisis that we have to treat as a public health crisis and we need to put enough resources in the communities that need it most, okay? And again, the Bronx is always getting the short end of the stick. I always say I'm so tired of, of us being first in everything bad and last in everything good. They need to, you know, we need to change that narrative even in COVID to make sure that we get the resources that we deserve and need in the Bronx. You get the final word. What do you want Bronxites to know? that I'm here for them, I love them, and that um, we, we're we gonna get through this. We're gonna get through all of the violence. You know, I, I pray each and every day that our community is gonna see. You know, we're having all these protests, black lives do matter, but black lives need to matter to us first and foremost, and that's what's in our community. So we need to care about each other first. We need to protest as hard about the violence that we see in our community as we are protesting about the police accountability issues. You know, that's one issue, but we need to start right at home. We need to do all that we can to make our communities healthy and safe and that they have a partner in the Bronx District Attorney. Bronx District Attorney Darcel Clark, thank you so much for joining us here on the Bronx Social Justice Forums. Thank you so much, Darren. It was a pleasure. It certainly no, it's my it's my pleasure as well. And so Thank you, uh, District Attorney Clark. Listen, we got to take a quick break, but coming up after this, we're going to introduce you to an original freedom rider here on the Social Justice Forum. We know that people are dealing with the health crisis, but there's also a lot of Food insecurity. We're giving out healthy food options, and that's what's key here. If you're a senior, you have a disability, they'll actually deliver meals to you. The residents are anxious, they're worried, they're scared, they want to be tested. When things were happening in our community, and, and we couldn't get the help. There's almost a presumption of criminality that, that attaches to your skin color. The site will prioritize those who are at highest risk in the population. If you feel symptoms and you'd like to visit one of these COVID-19 testing sites here in the Bronx, you may call the state health department's hotline. Important to note about this site is no reservations are needed. This is a walk-in clinic. A lot of us are out of work and looking for something to do. We have the machinery and the skills to make large scale of these masks and gowns. Take care of your people it's gonna go way further than we actually can understand. Right now, employees like myself are just adjusting to the new reality. Welcome back. 
The gruesome struggle of racial equality and justice has plagued communities of color for many generations. In the 1960s, national attention was focused on extreme racial discrimination in the South, as well as the challenges being faced by many, including housing discrimination, educational dis uh, discrimination, educational opportunities, and also the limited employment opportunities for African Americans. For seven months in the 1960s, there were hundreds of black and white volunteers who actually traveled on Southern bus and train stations in an attempt to compel the federal government to enforce a U.S. Supreme Court ruling declaring discrimination in interstate public transportation illegal. Our next guest was one of 15 original Freedom Riders in Mississippi determined to expose Southern resistance to a 1960 Supreme Court ruling, which desegregated facilities and bus and train stations. They were aiming to also transform our society into one of equality and justice. It's my pleasure, it's my privilege, it's my honor to introduce one of the original Freedom Riders here to share his point of view, none other than Reverend Leroy Glenwright. And Reverend Glenwright, thank you so much for being with us here on the Social Justice Forum. I'm glad to be of service. I want to take the time for you, for many people who may not know, um, you were one of those original Freedom Riders. You rode with uh, former Congressman John Lewis and also uh, C.T. Vivian, who was also a friend of yours. Uh, from your perspective, first of all, just your thoughts on the passing of John Lewis and C.T. Vivian, and both of their passings happened within 24 hours. And first of all, our condolences to you, too. Yes, it's, uh, it was quite shocking. You know, I received an email from one of my friends in, uh, from Fifth, where we went to school, uh, from California, informing me like 11.30 p.m. that John Lewis had passed. And I had previously uh, learned that CT had also uh, passed early in the day. It was quite a shock. But I thank you for the condolences. Uh, it's, uh, it was just amazing to, to hear that news uh, at, 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 at twice in one day. A lot of people don't know it, but John Lewis was also an ordained uh, Baptist minister, a graduate of uh, American Baptist Theological Seminary in Nashville, Tennessee. And upon graduation from there, he matriculated at this university where I was a student. And uh, let it be known that uh, he he was the uh, uh, picked up the uh, freedom rides uh, in in Washington D.C. after they was stopped uh, in 1947. Then he picked it up in uh, 1961 uh, with uh, uh, James Peck. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but James Peck was one of the original uh, Freedom Riders in what was called the Journey of Reconciliation in 1947. And it continued on up until uh, 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 Washington, D.C. They, they were testing to see if, if the Supreme Court's ruling was being implemented. And when they got to Washington, uh, then they halted it because they were uh, legal. Arrested, so then they decided that they were going to do it again in 1961, and that's where John Lewis was the one person from the Nashville movement who was uh, on the journey from Washington down. I think they got as far as Anderson, Alabama, where the, the bus was burned and I don't know, on Mother's Day in 1961. And Dr. Wright, I want you to take a moment with me and walk through it. We have uh, some very powerful pictures. And one of those pictures here is, I believe you are actually being arraigned with John Lewis. Tell us about what was happening then. Uh, we, were, we went before the judge. Uh, we were charged with uh, blocking the facts. But the, uh, the judge ruled that the uh, law had been repealed and thrown out. And so he dismissed the charges. And so we were let go on that. I'm not guilty. Being arrested for civil disobedience, being arrested uh, multiple times. Talk to us about that feeling of being arrested because uh, nowadays it's almost like being arrested for civil disobedience 
is almost like a cool thing. But back then, you were really putting your life on the line. Uh, I, I got hit in the head, and I, my left eye hit, and I still have problems with my left eye with about three times because we were standing in front of the movie theater, and this police officer hit me in the hit his head, my, my eye right here. They took me to the emergency room and caused quite a stir, but thank God I, I would survive that. Uh, but th there were other people who were beaten. I had incidents where we had sit-ins at the, I don't know if you know, the White Castle restaurant. Are you, are you familiar with that? Absolutely. And, uh, we, were, we were doing a sit-in there, and they told us we can't come in, and I had my hand, my elbows on the, on the counter. And the waitress took some hot, scalding hot water and poured it on 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 the counter and burned my elbows. You know, during that time, There's different incidents like that. But basically, uh, I, I I escaped any real danger, I, and I missed out on the Anderson thing because that that was the trip that John Lewis was going down down south and then he stopped there and they had said that they were going to stop the freedom riders after that but then the Nashville SNCC decided that we would continue it on so we sent representatives down to Birmingham drove them down there and Bull Connor I don't know if you're familiar with him but Bull Connor was the police chief and mayor and whatever at the time he was he uh he uh put them in the car, drove them back to the Tennessee st state line and told them to don't come back. But nonetheless, we were hard-headed. We went back, we sent another car back and he went from, from Birmingham. Well, some people got beat up in, uh, in, in, in Birmingham on another bus. There were two buses, Greyhound and Trailway. That then the new group that drove down there, they got on the bus and they had an escort. I guess it was ordered by the federal government. And uh, they were, they were uh, 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 going, escorted us from, from Birmingham, Alabama to Montgomery. Now I wasn't with that group at that time. So th then when they got to Birmingham, the police, Escort and the National they all left. And then this crowd beat up all the riders that were going from Birmingham to, to Montgomery. Then they sent in a, a National Guard and everything and broke that up. And uh, th that's when I, I ended the picture for the Freedom Rides. We rented a car and drove down to Montgomery. And we, we got there the day after the all the violence had broken around the Reverend Ralph Abernathy's church. The next day we drove, uh, we rode from uh, Montgomery to Jackson, Mississippi, but we had an escort all the way down. But d during the time when everybody had to take a rest stop, they, had, they would take you to a uh, African-American nightclub or something like a restaurant and you had to go to the restroom and the African American place because blacks and whites couldn't mix, although there were blacks and whites on the bus right. that was going to Mississippi. We got to Mississippi, uh, the sign said no, no color allowed and all that. And we went inside. Uh, it was pandemonium there in this Greyhound bus. Said people were hanging on the balconies, taking pictures, and all this stuff. Kind of they arrested us for breach of peace, took us down to jail and uh, arraigned us and we had a trial and uh, we, we got four months, I think it was, and $200 fine or something for breach of peace. And they put us in jail and some folks uh, opted out to appeal. And, they, and so uh, uh, we, we, we were that there separated. I got put in solitary confinement because I protested the, the treatment that they were doing one of the fellow uh, inmates. Of, so I think his name was Dave Dennis was who he was. And um, I got put in the solitary confinement. 
dark room with a little hole in the middle of the room and everything. And th then the sheriff came up and said, nah, we, you, we want to tell you boys, we don't want no trouble, you know. Uh, you, you know, we, we, we get, we'll all get along. So then he took us back down to the main cell. This time we weren't in the jail. We were in the county, Hines County Jail. So I was there a few days. We had a hunger strike and all this kind of stuff. And, and uh, uh, then I, I think I got out on bail. And when I got on bail, they transferred all, all the people who were there to uh, Raymond County. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm jumping the gun. I forgot. Before I got out on bail, they took us out to James uh, Raymond County Prison Farm. And um, they interrogated each one of them. So a couple of them, get, there were two young ladies with them. They, a couple of them got beaten up by these white deputies in, in, in uh, Raymond County. This is, it's, it's Raymond County, but it was just, that, that's, that's, that's the prison farm in Mississippi, which is right outside of Jackson. So one of my cellmates at, at Raymond County, he's John Moody. He said to me, he says, Leroy, he says, uh, don't, don't, uh, when you go down there, say yes, sir, and no, sir. Well, I, I wasn't raised to so mean yes, sir, and no, sir, too. <laughs> but they, they, they wanted, they wanted all black folks to, to say yes, sir, and no, sir. So I went out there. And I sit, put my head, my 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 back against the wall. And John Moody had told me that they beat him up for not saying yes, sir. So I put my back to the wall. And so he's telling me, he said, "I'm Warren Max Sullivan. We 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 have certain rules that be, you must say yes, sir, and no, sir, because our guards demand respect." So I I, I I'm shaking. I'm, I, I, I'm I look at one. And one of them say SOB, you know. So then he turned back to me. He said, now there would be no shaking of the head, pounding on the desk. He said, now are you, are you, are you, are you uh, going to say yes, sir? I, and I said to him, I'm a rebel, natural rebel. I said, no, you got your answer. He said, get up and, go, and don't walk too fast. So I. At this time, I'm looking at these three guards that were sitting there, and the one that called me the name he gets up. He gets up out of his seat. And by this time, he said, don't, "Don't walk too fast. I'm speeding." He pulls his gun out of his holster. Thank you, Lord, for being with me. You know, I got back to cell. Nobody put a hand on him. Then after that, one of the inmates who was with us got out on bail and he called Robert Kennedy, Attorney General Robert Kennedy. Robert Kennedy sent a group down there and they transfer, transferred us back to the Hines County, uh, Hines County Jail. Mm. And then we, we went on a hunger strike and then, then one thing, then eventually I, I you know, I, I, I got bailed out. A little bit more for me about your journey, because as you tell the story about what's occurred for you many times it looked as though that your life was definitely in jeopardy and you feared your life um what was it that made you say you know what i'm willing to put my life on the line i think that's that's the thing that really gets me about a lot of the freedom riders and even those john lewis and dr king um really just willing to put their life on the line what was it for you that said i'm willing to risk my life well i don't think i gave it that deep intellectual scrutiny, but I, well, I got caught up in the moment, you know. Every, everybody was involved, and I wanted to be a part of that involvement. But I, I, I didn't even consider, you know, I might get killed or anything like that. I just, well, I guess I, the Lord was on my side. You know? No, I don't guess. I know the Lord was on my side. Yeah, yeah. And for many people, the civil rights movement, of course, the 60s was 
uh, tied to you. You mentioned Ralph Abernathy. One person that we haven't talked about is Dr. King. Uh, what was your interaction, if any, with Dr. King during this whole period of time? Well, D Dr. King came to Nashville several times and spoke and everything. But one significant thing, when he gave I Have a, my, his I Have a Dream speech, mm -hmm. well, if you were to look to his left on his the level that he was at the end of the steps, you would have seen me. I, that's where I was doing the I Have a Dream speech. You know. John Lewis also gave a speech there, uh, very profound, and that was where people began to recognize who he was. Well, I remember because I had the opportunity of meeting, uh, you know, Congressman John Lewis, and uh, we had the opportunity to have lunch together. Uh, and that's my vivid memory of having a one-on-one -on -one lunch with him uh, in Washington, D.C. It was arranged by uh, then our Congressman, uh, John Katko, who wanted to talk to, we talked about social justice and we talked about being involved. Um, and then he proceeded to take me on this walking tour of all of the pictures in his office. And you talked about the, the March on Washington. And I remember because he took me to that picture and he showed me that picture. And this is what he said. He said, uh, this picture is a picture of when I spoke at the March on Washington. There were 10 speakers that day. I was number eight. Dr. King was number 10. And of all the speakers of the, at, the Mar at the March on Washington, I'm the only one that's still alive. And it was my thought that when he passed away, history actually passed away and history went on to be with history. And so of all the speakers that, that were there, all have since deceased, but you're still alive to tell the story. So what do you want people to know about yourself, people like John Lewis, people like Dr. King, people like Abernathy, what do you want people to know? Well, that, that if you're persistent and you don't take no for an answer, uh, 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 then you will be successful. You have to be in trust in God. If you trust in God, you will make it through. Are you happy with what you're seeing today? I mean, obviously, uh, we're seeing a lot of protests and we're seeing some change in the criminal justice system, uh, particularly by way of police officers ad addressing police brutality. Are you happy with the activism that you're seeing today? Yes and no. Uh, it, 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 it's like it's a cyclical thing, up and down, up and down, and doesn't really not, it, to me, it's not, cons not consistent enough. To, they get diverted too easy about them, but one thing I, that I, 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 I'm proud to know is that here in Syracuse, they had that 40-day 40, 40 march uh, uh, for Black Lives Matter. And, I thought, and the people stuck with it for 40 days. So I thought that was a, a wonderful thing. This yeah, well, I think, but I think, Dr. Wright, uh, you know, Glenn Wright, that it's also about your just due. I think Americans don't know the sacrifice that you made as being a freedom rider. I think that when we talk about the freedom riders, the big names will always get the attention, of course, and, and rightfully so. You've got the John Lewis's, you've got the Dr. Martin Luther King's. Uh, I know also another, you know, another person, uh, the Reverend Emery Proctor, a uh, big name out of Syracuse, New York, pastor of the People's Church. Um, he was a freedom rider and yourself. And you guys actually um, literally put your lives on the line. And I think that if we look at activism today and we look at where we are today, we also have to look back from whence we came. And when we look back at whence we came, we wouldn't be where we are as far as voting rights, as far as civil rights, as far as many of the rights, if it wasn't for a person such as yourself. So you deserve it and, 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 you, and you definitely need that and then much, much more. Um, and so give me that thought about what it means to you today, looking back at the part that you played in history. Well, to me, it, uh, it, it seems that we still have a long way to go. You know, we still have police brutality, which is plaguing the, the, the black community uh, over and over and over again, and nothing being done. You got to look in Chicago, out in Seattle, all the, the uh, President Trump has sent in National Guard to beat down the people in both those cities. And, you know, we, we have a long way to go. You know, it's, yeah. unfortunately, 
it, it, this far, like the 40 some years since the original free riding sit ins and stand ins, we still fighting the battle. You mentioned the name Bull Connor earlier. Of course, I'm very familiar with Bull Connor. Also, President Lyndon Johnson. When you think about President Lyndon Johnson and you think about President Donald Trump, um, do you find similarities? Uh, I, I wouldn't put uh, 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 Donald Trump in, in the same uh, lane as Lyndon Johnson. I, I have a greater respect for Lyndon Johnson than I do with Donald Trump. Donald Trump is for Donald Trump and only for Donald Trump. But uh, he, he said, it looks like he's seeing the handwriting on the wall that the polls are saying that he, uh, uh, he, he's, he's not going to, uh, not going to be reelected. And, and uh, uh, it, it's, it's just, it's a sin and shame. Now you mentioned Congressman Crackle. He's not one of my favorite either, you know, so. Uh, uh, Dana Balter, I think, should be uh, elected. Um, yeah. And for those who don't know, uh, up in the upstate New York area, there is a congressional seat that's up for grabs. Uh, Congressman John Cackle, the Republican incumbent, who's also uh, endorsed Donald Trump, is going up against the uh, Democrat, Dana Balter. And so when you hear uh, Reverend Glenn Wright say about uh, Dana Balter, uh, that's the Democrat that's running for the seat uh, compared to uh, the Congressman, the incumbent, uh, John Kako. Are you hopeful uh, that this presidential election will bring about change um, in America? I hope so. I hope that uh, 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 Joe, Joe Biden uh, uh, nominates Stacey Adams from Atlanta, Georgia. That's who I'd like to see as his running mate and see the two of them get elected. Mm. And talk to me about what do you want to see by activism? Because there's a lot of activists out there, people with boots on the ground. What's the message you want to send to them as a freedom rider, as a civil rights uh, advocate, as one who fought for human rights and one who's been on the battlefield far longer than many people who are uh, presently alive today? Talk to us about what you want to see. Well, I want to see people get more involved. You want to see more people register and vote. A lot of people are registered and they're not voting. You know, they, so they say, what's the answer? It's, nothing's changing. And so they won't exercise their constitutional right. But I think I would like to encourage more people to register to vote and then and, and, uh, encourage them to encourage other people to register and vote. Well, Reverend Leroy Glenwright, I just want to thank you because I think that you're a legend um, I think when we talk about the civil rights icons of John Lewis, C.T. Vivian, uh, Joseph Lawry, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Ralph Abernathy, and all of these other great names that we that we have that, that are worthy of accolades and worthy of honor, that your name ranks right up there with them. And so it's been a pleasure, a privilege, and an honor to actually have you sharing with us here on the Social Justice Forums. Thank you so much for first of all your sacrifice and your continued labor of love in the area of racial justice, equity, and also civil rights, the Reverend Leroy Glenwright. Well, we wanna thank the Reverend Leroy Glenwright, and we also wanna thank Bronx District Attorney Darcel Clark for joining us here on the Social Justice Forum. A lot of information was shared here today, and that's what we wanna do on the Social Justice Forum. We wanna give you the necessary information so that you can become more informed as to the things that continue to go on in our society and our community. For all of us here on the Social Justice Forum, I am Darren Jaime. We encourage you to come back next week where we'll have a brand new episode. We'll have some more interactive discussion, and we'll bring you some more people who are actually making a difference in our community. Darren Jaime saying take care, God bless, We'll talk to you soon.